what I'd like to talk about today and uh, what's brought me to the edge of my chair recently is uh, the Vonich Manuscript, which is something that, uh, though I had read in occultism fairly deeply and in alchemical literature and that kind of thing, I had never heard of this until about a year and a half ago. And uh, a friend of mine, Ralph Abraham, who's a mathematician at Santa Cruz, began pushing this at me, mentioning this encoded manuscript that uh, people were interested in trying to figure out what it said. And since I had never heard of it, I dismissed it. Uh, I assumed that he was misinformed or that if this thing existed, I surely would have heard of it. But... Uh, Eventually, I tracked down the references that he gave me, and I discovered a very curious cul-de-sac in the history of ideas. First of all, it is a manuscript. That means it's written in longhand. It's not a printed book. Only one copy is known to exist. It's at the Beneke Rare Book Room at Yale. And it was deposited there by the estate of Mr. Alfred Vonich uh, when his wife died. The Vonich manuscript, here are the known facts. It was, it first appears in uh, 1586 at the court of Rudolf II of Bohemia, which if you know that court in that period, this was the mad Rudolf of Bohemia, this guy who was surrounded by astrologers, alchemists, cryptographers, all the intellectual foment of occult Protestant Europe was centered at this court. And uh, into this situation comes an unknown person, a courier, who sells this manuscript to Rudolf for the equivalent of uh, $14,000, 300 gold ducats, which is an enormous amount of money to pay for something like this. And um, it was in his possession. It's encoded. It is not written in any known alphabet. It is written in what scholars call Vonich script, of which this manuscript is the only known example in existence. And part of the problem of the Vonich manuscript has to do with locating instances of Vonich script somewhere else. It's over 275 pages long. It has a hundred, over 150 color illustrations of plants in one category, what appear to be astrological diagrams in another category, and then a completely unclassifiable set of images which seem to be basically little naked ladies bathing in strange fountains or perhaps dissected flowers or it isn't clear what it is. Uh, the emperor would not have paid so much money for it if he hadn't been convinced that uh, there was something going on with it. He had uh, cryptographers at his court who were very adept at decoding manuscripts. None of them were ever able to make any progress with it. When his court collapsed in the incident of the winter king and queen of 1619, uh, the manuscript passed to his botanist, a man named Marcy, and at his death, it passed. To, to an unknown party who owned it for 20 years. And the next place where it's picked up is in the library of Athanasius Kircher, who was one of the great polymaths of uh, the 17th century and a man who himself worked on artificial languages and synthetic languages. And he, uh, letters exist of his inquiring after this manuscript, and eventually it came into his possession, but there is no mention of it in any of his known work on artificial languages. At uh, around 1635, he decided to join the Jesuit order and uh, gave all his books to a Jesuit college south of Rome, 
where this book apparently sat on the shelf for the next, uh, what is it, 230 years, uh, until 1906, when Mr. Alfred Vonich bought the entire library, a rare book dealer, shipped it back to Brooklyn, and in going through the stuff, came upon this manuscript. Um, now, what's so great about a book which nobody can read? Well, first of all, it's very unusual books which no one can read. Codes, immensely powerful methods exist for breaking codes because this is a matter of military intelligence and uh, defense uh, concerns and uh, very sophisticated uh, computer techniques exist to analyze any supposed piece of code and extract meaning from it, determine whether it is in fact encoded language or not, whether you can tell what it says or not. And the Vonich manuscript has become a kind of conundrum of the intelligence community. Retired intelligence officers take it on and attempt to crack it. In fact, uh, one of the best books written about the Vonich manuscript is called The Vonich Manuscript, An Elegant Enigma by Mary de Imperio. And it is only available from the National Security Agency, Central Security Office, Fort Meade, Maryland. This is what your tax dollars are being spent for, is to decode this uh, 400-year-old manuscript. Okay. Um, Vonich script, the most sophisticated uh, computer analysis shows that the manuscript definitely is uh, a language there is meaning, the occurrence of prefixes and suffixes, certain internal rules of grammar have been identified, but uh, the meaning has eluded all comers. And, it, and several people, uh, if there were more time, we could go into people whose whole careers have rested on their supposed decoding of it. A man named uh, William Newbery in the 1920s claimed a complete decipherment, and it was later exposed to be a, a sincere but misguided uh, mental derangement had contributed to uh, his belief that he had decoded other people have made attempts, but all of them, uh, none are convincing. And so this is where the matter rests. One edition of this, of this manuscript exists. It's never been decoded. My idea about it is that uh, to understand the Vonich manuscript, you have to understand the career of John V, who was uh, the greatest, Magus of the Elizabethan age, the court astrologer of Elizabeth I of England, the man who had more, he had the largest library in England. Elizabeth and Sir Walter Riley and Sir William Sidney visited him to see his collection of books. He was, he uh, wrote on the elements of Euclid, he wrote books on navigation and astronomy, but he also was an occultist and into secret codes. He was also an intelligence agent. He had been at the court of Rudolf the year before the sale is alleged to have taken place, he and his friend Edward Kelly, and uh, they had brooded it about that Roger Bacon, the 13th century English monk, was the greatest, astro uh, greatest alchemist of all time, and they had really made a flap about Bacon in Prague at the court of Rudolf. Then a series of alchemical experiments where they had promised the emperor to make gold and had failed caused them to be exiled to Treblona. So they were in Treblona when this alleged sale of this manuscript took place in Prague. Now, all occult codes in Europe are based, or at that time were based, on the work of one man, the bishop of uh, uh, Johannes Trithemius of Sponheim, who wrote a book called the Stenographica, which was published in 1535. And in it, he explained numerous methods drawn from Roman sources and his own imagination for composing codes and encrypting messages. 
And all of the uh, occult codes which follow are based on this. D hand copied uh, a manuscript of the Stenographica when he encountered it in Paris. He was involved with a series of angel contacts where he elaborated a language called Enochian, which, like Vonich, is not written in uh, characters of the English alphabet, but has a peculiar set of characters unique to itself. Over 3,000 words have been defined in Enochian, first through D's uh, uh, spirit contacts, and later the Golden Dawn took it up and further expanded it. But in these diaries, which are deposited in the British Museum, there are 93 pages of encrypted material, which are columns of numbers. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, to eliminate the possibility that D was the author of the Vonich manuscript, the encoding methods of this material in his diary need to be computer analyzed and then compared to the Vonich material. The other possibility, which still involves D, is uh, this person I mentioned, Edward Kelly, his companion of many years. Kelly's entree. Kelly was a man of the lower classes, a much younger man, a scoundrel by all accounts. And his entree to D was he came to him with a book which was in code, which he had claimed to have found in a uh, crypt of a uh, looted Catholic monastery in Wales. This was uh, during the period just after Henry VIII's break with Rome. Uh, which, And he called this book uh, The Gospel of St. Dunstable. And he worked on the decoding of it, but we lose sight of that book and no known copy of it, no copy of it exists so far as we know. But Arthur D., John D.'s son, in his diary, talks about how in the period before D. and Kelly went to Europe, his father spent a great deal of time studying a book which was covered all over with hieroglyphy. And, and uh, I believe... One of two things, I mean, this is what seems reasonable to me, that uh, that either Dee and Kelly ponied up a phony manuscript, which they sold into the court of root because they were poor. There's no question about it. I mean, these guys have come to the end of their ropes. I believe only John Dee is the only man who could have produced the Vonich manuscript if it's contemporaneous with him. Either that or there is actually some truth to this strange story about Kelly bringing a book to D uh, that he had found in Wales. And in that case, Welch and computer analysis of Welch and looking at Welch as the possible basic text of the Vonich manuscript should be done. And this has never been done. So I'm seeing a further advance in Vonich studies logically demands an analysis of the codes in John D.'s diaries in a true and faithful relation and analysis of Welch in relationship to the known internal grammar of the Vonich manuscript. And uh, there are other angles uh, on it. Uh, well, let me think. For what would you like to do with it? Well, I would like to know what it says. Uh, at first, it sounds very mysterious, and you actually reach out toward the idea that the reason the Vonage manuscript can't be read is because it is not in code at all. It simply is in a non-human language. It's like an object from another dimension, which just, you know, here it is. It cannot be decoded because uh, the bridge is too great. But I, another possible problem is perhaps modern people, modern cryptographers who deal with codes are overconfident of their ability to break any code. Perhaps there is just some weird, quirky way in which this code is composed, that it would forever elude your effort to decoding. I mean, for instance, what if somewhere there exists a set of grids, which if laid over the pages in a certain way, cause 
the part of the Vonage script which could then be subjected to normal methods of uh, decoding and would quickly reveal its uh, grammar. And, yeah. What does it look like? What does the Vonage manuscript look like? It's a small book, 10 by 7 inches and probably about 2 and a half inches thick. These, uh, these watercolor drawings are extraordinarily uh, uh, peculiar. I mean, especially for that period, because all herbals, of which there were only about 50 or so in existence at that time, were a, a uh, drew from a common pool of imagery, which went back to the herbals of Dioscorides and that kind of thing. There was a very limited pool of images in the European mind at this point in time, and yet the Vonich manuscript is utterly unique. It's completely peculiar. And the what way are the ingredients of the ink from the Ah, well, none of this has been looked at and should be looked at. This is another thing. Chemical, a chemical attack on the manuscript itself should be mounted. See, uh, Newbery, the guy who advanced a, a, a decipherment in the 20s, he believed because a letter accompanied it that said it was a Bacon manuscript. Roger Bacon, and this also points at Dee, because Dee was under the patronage of the Earl of Northumberland, and he uh, looted a number of monasteries where there were large Baconian libraries, and in fact, Dee had 53 Baconian manuscripts in his possession, in cataloged in his library at Mortlake. Uh, only 41 of those texts are known to exist in any form at all today. His library was burned while he was in Europe. It was burned by a mob incited against this wizard. And uh, uh, so it may be... It, but so Newbery believed then that it was a Baconian manuscript. Right, well, Bacon gets in there everywhere. But when you look at it, it's obviously 16th century. Everything about it marks it. And Bacon, of course, was 13th century. So it's clearly, it, there are many other angles. I mean, like D is implicated no. in the Rosicrucian conspiracy. He was definitely involved at the very beginning. His book, The Hieroglyphic Monad, served as a model for the two primary Rosicrucian documents, the Fama and the Confessio, which were released secretly uh, in the early 17th century. And uh, it all was coming from Central Europe, from Bohemia and uh, Prague, uh, the court of Frederick the Elector Palatine of Bohemia and this guy Rudolf II of Bohemia. Of, uh, of Bohemia. This court, these were the alchemical courts, these were where the alchemical presses were operating, and the uh, this Protestant alchemical enlightenment was taking place that the coming of the Thirty Years' War and the collapse of the Winter King and Queen obliterated this hope. This was a very complicated moment in uh, European history. Collapse of the Winter King and Queen? Yes, this was an incident. You see, Frederick the Elector Palatine of Bohemia, who was the patron of all these alchemical presses and alchemists, wedded uh, the daughter of James I of England, whose name was Elizabeth. And he, uh, this was around uh, 1615, and he thought that by wedding the daughter of the King of England, he was getting the nod from the King of England to go forward with this uh, Protestant alchemical revolt. Actually, James' plan was to wed one of his sons to a, a Habsburg Spanish Catholic empress to balance it out. And he was appalled when... Uh, when uh, Frederick the Elector began to move on this alchemical revolution. Well, then, when Rudolf of Bohemia, the guy who bought the Vonich manuscript, when he died, uh, there, he, there was actually a set of German princes who, by election, would choose his successor. And they chose Frederick and his queen, Elizabeth, the daughter of James. And they moved from Heidelberg and to... Prague and ruled in the winter of 1619 and 20, but by May of 1620, uh, 
uh, the Habsburgs had mounted an army and they laid siege to Prague and uh, Frederick was killed. She fled. It was actually an amazing moment in European history. Michael Meyer, who was one of the great alchemists of that period, died in the streets of Prague in that siege. And one of the young French soldiers in this Habsburg army was the 18-year-old René Descartes of soldiering and sowing his wild oats. This is the period out of which this manuscript emerges, a period when secret societies were rife across Europe, when John Dee was spying for the throne of England and at the same time pursuing his own peculiar interests in angel communication and astrology and Kabbalah and uh, all these things. And... um, the Vonich manuscript is indicative of this paradoxical state of mind and of the uh, the uh, really peculiar and now nearly incomprehensible sort of worldview that these people had. And it would be very interesting to know what it says. I mean, it looks very promising. After all, John D. was... Uh, definitely the preeminent intellect of his time and the fact that he may have faked this to pay the bills uh, I would bet that even at that there is sense embedded in it somewhere but the key is D and D and the lines of research which study of his life would suggest the well changle the diary codes all this are you pursuing it I'm advising a group of people in Santa Cruz, computer people and just interested people, and my voice is one of uh, several. But uh, definitely it's one of the great oddities of human thought and not much heard of because it simply is uh, an elegant enigma 